I don't think I'm unlike anybody else, but one of the challenges that I think we all face in our lives is that we always want our lives to grow in a straight line, kind of we have point A, we're getting to point B. The path is very straight, it's efficient, we know what it is and how we're going to get there. And the challenge of life really is that it's never in a straight line, is it? Is that you, you chart a course and you say, okay, I'm going to get from here to here and you want it to be straight, you want it to work very simply and efficiently, but really it's a little bit all over the place. That you have detours and you have times when you just stop growing. Let me give you an example of this. So right now it's about the fourth Sunday of a brand new year, right? How many of you are still on your New Year's resolutions going strong right now, four weeks in? Praise God for like the 10 of you who are still going strong. (laughs) Now, I realize that some of you didn't raise your hand because... You gave up on doing New Year's resolutions a long time ago. You were done with the like six minutes of New Year's resolutions. And so you just don't even do them anymore. See, we want to keep growing. But oftentimes it happens in fits and starts. And it's a challenging part of life because we're saying, I I need to get from here to here. And I have a plan and then... It's not a straight line of growth. It's kind of good days and bad days, up days and down days, and it's kind of all over the place. And it makes life challenging. But the key for us is to realize that although our growth is not in a straight line, we have to make sure we get the trend right. That if more often than not we are finding those next steps, then we're going to get to where we want to. But it'll never be a straight line. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much you grab hold of it, like this thing's going to happen perfectly and i got to get to here and this is what it's going to... It never really works that way. And to bring it to what we're going to study today, this is also true specifically in our relationship with Jesus, in our walk with Christ. That we all along life's way, found ourselves saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you. God revealed himself in us and to us, and we start to follow. But following Jesus, as much as we'd love it to be, and as much as sometimes as pastors and churches we can tell you, man, you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to be all nice, neat, and tidy, and you're just going to follow Jesus, and you're going to be so, you're just be so tight, you guys are going to be like BFFs. But you start walking, and it, there's seasons in it. It's not easy. You you look back on your walk with Jesus and you find that there has been detours. There has been times when you're following Jesus and then all of a sudden you're not. There's been times when there's been influences in your life that have pulled you away from following Jesus. And what's amazing is, is that that's exactly what's going on in Paul's letter to the Galatians, isn't it? See, Paul is writing this letter to this church who he loves, these churches in this region of Galatia that he planted. And after Paul planted the church, some other influences came in and the church found itself leaving just Jesus and getting caught up in religion. That it's not just Jesus. It's you have to believe in Jesus and you need to keep the law of Moses. And Paul is writing them this letter to be able to say to them, listen, I want you to follow just Jesus, not Jesus plus anything else. And so one of the things I love is although maybe the details have changed from what was going on in the churches in Galatia some 2,000 years ago to our lives, all the principles stay the same. So I want you to open there. Open up to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 as we continue this series that we're calling Jesus is Greater than everything. And so your hashtag is hashtag CCC greater. If you're on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, I always love looking back at those hashtags and seeing how God is speaking to people. Now, if you didn't bring a Bible to church with you, no worries. We have Bibles for you on the pews in front of you. Take them out. I, I want you to find Galatians chapter three. I'll get you there because 
I'm not just making this stuff up. I want you to be able to look at it in black and white letters on a piece of paper, or if you have a smartphone, you can just pull that up, and just we have an open network here. Just type in Galatians chapter 3. I want you to be able to read along with me to see where we're getting these things from, and you'll see why this is so applicable to our lives. Now, that Paul's letter to Galatians, it's kind of in the middle of your New Testament. So the New Testament begins with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the book of Acts, which takes, I mean, all of those. It's probably between all those four books, it's probably almost 100 chapters. And then you get Paul's letters. And so Galatians is the fourth letter of the Apostle Paul. It sits between 2 Corinthians and the letter to the Ephesians. So I've told you this before. Paul's letter to Galatians breaks down into three parts. Chapters 1 and 2, then chapters 3 and 4, and then chapters 5 and 6. Chapters 1 and 2, it's Paul's personal account. He's using his own testimony to help the churches in Galatia. So chapters 1 and 2 are personal. Chapters 3 and 4 are theological. And theos is God, and logical means the study of God. So it's doctrine. It's truth-telling. Who is God? And then chapters 5 and 6 are practical or application. Because this is who God is, this is how we ought to live right now. So by joining into chapter 3 right now, we're moving into the theological section. Now, I realize that in a church the size of Crossroads and a church with a history like Crossroads, that right now all of us find ourselves in different places. For some of us, you've been walking with the Lord for twice as long as I've been alive, and you have heard Pastor Bill Ritchie teach for years, you've studied the Word, you've read the Bible every day. And for others of you, you're here right now, and you don't even know what Galatians is. Just, you know, Galatians, it's, it's a region. It's like the letters to the churches in Clark County, right? And so some of you come in here with a history with Christianity, and others of you are here right now and saying, I don't even know about all this. I'm just checking it out. And really what I want you to know is chapters 3 and 4 in Paul's letter to the Galatians is a thick section. There's a lot of stuff in here. And literally you can buy books of people who have devoted their lives only to studying what they would call Pauline theology. Literally like where their whole entire life is focused on studying what Paul's teaching is and how it looks. Go on Amazon, put in Pauline theology, almost all the books will be upwards of a thousand pages. And so what my goal is, is my goal is to be your tour guide, walking us through some pretty thick, dense sections of Scripture. And if you're brand new to Christianity, or if you're just checking it out, there's going to be important things for you. And if you're here and you've been walking with Jesus for, for a long time, there's going to be a lot of stuff for you as well. And my hope is that no matter where you find yourself today, there's going to be things that God is going to want to speak to you through this text. And I'm going to try not to get us weighed down in uh, big words, although we like them. And if I use a big word, I'll just try to explain what that word means. But our goal is to put legs on the message of Jesus. That's always our goal. What does this mean for us? So let's jump right on in. Galatians chapter 3, picking up in verse 1. The Apostle Paul says this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore... He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, you'll notice in these five verses that the Apostle Paul asks six probing questions to the churches in Galatia. Now, these churches are struggling because They've moved from believing in just Jesus, the gospel that Paul preached, to having now, you need to believe in Jesus, plus you need to keep the law of Moses. Right? They've allowed themselves to move from just faith in Jesus to Jesus plus 
works of law. And that's why I've called this message, Jesus is greater than religion. Because Jesus, believing in Jesus isn't religion, it's a relationship. And that relationship motivates a new way of living, a new way of being human, a new way of looking at the world. But religion is any type of human attempt to say, if I do these things, God will be happy with me. Right? So religion is, I am going to obey in whatever the standard I have. It, for the churches in Galatia, it was the Jewish law, the law of Moses. If I obey these things, then God will accept me. But Jesus, and the good news is that God has accepted me, therefore I live in response to God's love and I act differently. And you might think, well, okay, so Fusco, that's splitting hairs. But I'm here to tell you, if you don't split those hairs, you either end up in a new form of bondage, religious slavery, or you get set free in the gospel. And the churches in Galatia have allowed themselves to end up in a new form of slavery to law keeping. And so Paul asked them six probing questions. And so I want to start with this. We need to ask ourselves these questions. Ask yourself these questions. Now, why do I say that? Because part of probing questions is it keeps us honest with who we are, right? Part of allowing people to ask you honest questions and probing questions is it causes you now to have to look at yourself. And isn't that our biggest problem? We have blind spots. We all do. And you know what the problem with our blind spots are? As I always say, the person who's blind to it is the last person to realize they have the blind spot. So by asking ourselves either these questions or designing our own set of questions given the things that we're growing in and struggling through, helps keep us with our eye on the things that we have a tendency not to realize. And so Paul asked them six questions, all trying to drive them back to believing just in Jesus as opposed to becoming religious and being interested in law-keeping. Now, he begins with, O oh, foolish Galatians. Now, you'll notice in your Bible it's got an exclamation mark, but one of the struggles with Bible interpretation is that we don't, hear Paul saying it. We don't see his body language. And so it's been said that 80% of communication is nonverbal. So when Paul says, oh foolish Galatians, is he angry? We don't know. Is he brokenhearted? We don't know. Is he frustrated with them? We don't know. Is he sad for them? We don't know. But what we do know about the Apostle Paul is that Paul's intentions is always what we would call pastoral. He has the heart of a shepherd. He wants to see them grow up and mature into their heads. So whether or not he's angry or frustrated, which he could be, or whether he's brokenhearted and sad, he begins by saying, you guys are being foolish. And we're going to get down and a few questions down. He's going to say, are you so foolish? So part of the Galatians' issue is that they're being foolish. But notice the first question, verse 1. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? So the first question is, is who got you off track? He says, who has bewitched you? That's a, a strange word. How many of you remember the TV show, Bewitched? Yeah. For those of you who don't know, you can look it up on YouTube. You can see it was a fun little show. Back when uh, nighttime television was still watchable <laughs> and not in the gutter, you know what I mean? But the idea of being bewitched, it's, it's the idea of having a spell cast upon you, being deceived. And he's saying, you guys, who has deceived you? And what is he worried about? What is the deception? Look at what it says. That you should not obey the truth. So the churches in Galatia has been moved. They've been, a spell has been cast upon them that now that they should not obey the truth. So the, the issue here is that in the eyes of the Apostle Paul and in the eyes of God, the churches in Galatia are now not following the truth. Now I realize that when I say that, 
in 21st century America, that there's some of you going to be like, oh, this is why I don't believe in Christianity. This is why I don't like religion. Because who are you to say what the truth is? And I'm here to tell you, I am nobody. But if there's a God, and there is, and if that God is perfect and all-loving and creates and sustains everything, which is who God is, then God is allowed to say, this is right and this is wrong. This is true and this is not. And we have to realize that because we live in a world, our culture has the Pontius Pilate syndrome. Remember yesterday, what is truth? As if truth can be arbitrarily designed by any given person. Well, it's your truth and my truth. Our culture says things like that. I'm here to tell you, no. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And because Jesus is fully God, created and sustains everything, knows what ultimate human flourishing is, God is allowed to say, this is true and this is not. So don't think, I'm not telling you this. That's why I have you open it up. Look, this is what God's word says. Now, don't get mad at me. I'm nobody. It's not like, well, why is is the dreadlock guy allowed to tell us what truth is? I'm nobody. You know? (laughs) This is God's truth. And the churches in Galatia have left, they've had a spell, so to speak, cast upon them that now they're not following the truth. They're not obeying God's truth. And then Paul says something amazing at the end of verse 1. He says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Now, what the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, you guys have gotten taken off track. A spell has been cast upon you, and I can't believe it because Jesus Christ has been clearly portrayed amongst you as crucified. That word portrayed, you know how you can translate it? Being billboarded. You know when something's on a billboard? It's on a big sign and everyone sees it. Paul is saying, look, when you guys received the gospel through the ministry of me and the other apostles, the crucifixion, the death and resurrection of Jesus was on billboard display. You saw what it means. And I'm here to tell you, my friends, part of you and I obeying the gospel, following Jesus, is that we in our lives now billboard to the world what the death and resurrection of Jesus is all about. Our our personal lives tell the story of what it means to, to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus. And that is why you and I asking ourselves probing questions is so important. Because for each one of us, we don't always billboard the Jesus message so well, do we? Because we got stuff. We got issues. You got issues. You know I got issues. We all got issues. And so God is doing a work in each one of our lives to say, I want to purify the billboard of Jesus in your life. And we all have different things that get us off track. Let me give you a a little quick, quick hits. Things that are common to get us off track from billboarding, portraying Jesus Christ for who he is in the world. One is... The desire for a relationship. I don't know how many times a guy meets a gal and one of them isn't solid in their faith and somebody who was solid starts to drift away because they want to please this person who maybe they believe in Jesus, but they're not seeking to honor Jesus with the totality of life. And someone who is so well billboarding Jesus starts to drift. Sometimes it's vocation driven it's not wrong to have a job it's not wrong to have wrong to have relationships but sometimes our pursuit of financial stability on however we define it or wealth all of a sudden we start to cut a couple corners rather than saying you go into business i'm going to honor the lord in my business and then you start cutting corners cutting corners cutting corners and now all of a sudden the billboard is not clear oftentimes with the way that we hold very personal views all of a sudden, we're not, display, we're not billboarding God's love and justice at the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus in our lives. So you've got to ask yourself, how's my billboard of Jesus looking? Would anyone even know that I'm billboarding Jesus, that I'm portraying Jesus in my life? For Paul, he was like, look, we showed you what it looked like. 
we clearly portrayed Jesus Christ crucified amongst you. You saw it. You beheld it. It was in neon lights. I can't believe you guys have gotten away. So that's the first question. Look at the second question. This only, verse 2, I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, this question, Paul is saying to them and to us, remember your roots. That's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, when you came to know Jesus, did you come to know Jesus by a work of God's Spirit or by works of law? He's saying, your conversion, also called regeneration, did that happen because the Spirit did it and you believed by faith or by some work that you did? Now, everybody knows, and we talked about it last week, that we are justified by faith apart from works. See, when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Spirit entered your life because you believed in Jesus, not because you believed in Jesus and you went to church every week, which is not a bad thing, but it's not a saving thing. That it was this and something else. It was this plus, oh, I realized I was supposed to say these words and I pray in this special way. No, you got saved because you trusted in Jesus, you just responded to what Jesus did and you trust it. So he's saying, remember your roots. When you came to know Jesus, how did it happen? Did it happen by works or by faith? And we all know the answer is what? It's by faith. And I'm here to tell you, I realize right now there's many of you in this room. You're here, you're just checking Christianity out. What you need to realize is that the work that God wants to do in your life, all you need to do is respond to the work that he's already done. By believing, by trusting. And a lot of trust is, and I've heard it explained this way. It's like if there's a chair right here. Imagine that there's a chair, and I'm like, yeah, I believe that that chair can hold me. Right? I'm believing it, but how do you really know if you believe it when you sit in it? When you take your weight off of your own control and you put it onto the chair, that's when you trust in action. And for you and I, we need to learn how to trust the Lord. Not just to say, I believe in him, but to literally sit in the chair, the, the comfy chair of faith in Christ. And I, and I don't believe that just for people who've never put their faith and trust in Jesus, because I know for a lot of us, we believe in Jesus and we've, we believe in Jesus, but are we really sitting in the chair? Are we really trusting him or do we believe and we're really trusting our own resources? So he's like, remember your roots. You came to a saving knowledge of Jesus by faith, not by works of law. Then in verse 3, look at what it says. Are you so foolish? Now, that's a kind of a tough word from Paul, isn't it? Paul wasn't afraid to, to get into it with him. And now what's good is the word foolish, it does not mean somebody who is either mentally deficient or who pretends to be a fool. That would be the Greek word moros, which we get our word moron from. He doesn't use that word there. Okay, so some of you can be like, oh, yeah, I can use moron because Paul said it. I'm just quoting scripture. No, not, not, none of that. He's, he's questioning their logic because the Greek word that Paul uses here, it literally suggests somebody who's, it's the actions of someone who can think but fails to use the powers of perception that they've been given. So it's not somebody who is deficient. It's somebody who actually knows better. And if somebody were to step into using all of God's spiritual resources that we have in Christ, we wouldn't act that way. Now, when you put it in those terms, that's kind of a challenging question, isn't it? Because for all of us, we have to ask ourselves, am I not partaking of all the spiritual resources that I have in Christ by the Spirit to make decisions about my life? And if you ask yourself, am I being so foolish... Well, you just better hold on to your hat for the answers. Because it's amazing, because God loves us enough to say, listen, since you're asking, there's this area and there's this there. And I'll be honest, with you, I always say, I don't preach a message unless I ask God to let me live it. And I ask God this question, in what areas am I not utilizing all that you have given me in decision making for my life? And God was lovingly direct with me on a number of areas. And I'm so grateful for that because oftentimes we have not because we ask not. So ask the question, where is my spiritual logic not being utilized? It's a great question. But again, don't ask questions that you don't want answers to. 
Because if you do, then you're going to get answers that you don't want. But these are good questions. They're probing questions. Now look at the next question, the, the fourth question. In the middle of verse 3, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? Now, I think in regards to the Jesus is greater than religion reality, this is big. Having begun in the spirit, are you seeking to be made perfect in the flesh? This was the Galatians problem. They began in the spirit. God did a work in their life, and now they're seeking to perfect themselves by the things that they do. Remember I said that we are justified by faith last week, and in this question of how you began, did you begin by faith or works, and it's by faith? Just as we are justified by faith, we are converted or regenerated by faith, what we learn in this verse is that we are also sanctified by faith. The growth in holiness that each one of us are experiencing, if indeed you put your faith and trust in Jesus, that also happens not by the things that you do, but by your trust in the finished work of Jesus. It's not like you get saved and the Spirit doesn't work, and now you have to work everything else out. Your growth in the things of God, holiness, actually also happens by faith in God, not by the things that you do. And right here, I believe this is where Christianity becomes a religion for a lot of us. Because we get saved by a supernatural work of God, and then you get ushered into, in order to grow, I need to do this thing, this thing, this thing, and this thing, and then I'll grow. Now, don't get me wrong. God has given us all a ton of tools to use. But those tools do not work in and of themselves. Those tools work in conjunction when it is motivated by trusting God. Let me give you some examples. Somebody believes in Jesus and wants to be made perfect by works. And so what do they do? They read their Bible ferociously. Good thing. But if you read your Bible, divorced from trusting God, you become one of those grumpy, dried-up, orthodox Bible scholars where they know everything about the Word, but they can't love a person because that person's doctrine is so wrong. And And it's time for worship, and they're like, I don't want to worship. I just want to study the Word. Because the book has become more important than the God who inspired the book. The book is designed to promote us to worship. It happens. And I believe for many of us, we got saved by a work of grace in the Spirit, and you're trying to perfect yourself by works. You're trying to build your own Tower of Babel. You know that, you, and it's, you believe in Jesus, but if I do these things, then God really loves me. And if I don't do these things, then God really doesn't love me. And I'm here to tell you, that is works righteousness. You realize you cannot do one thing to make God love you more. Or one thing to make God love you less. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus. You, that's a shocking thing, right? But it's true. See, we grow not based on works, but by faith. And God, and God loves us enough to give us this information so that we learn. I know what it's like to seek to be perfected by works. Let me give you a, a This is an example. I remember when I was uh, an assistant pastor down in the Bay Area, there was a pastor. And this pastor decided he was going to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. That's what Jesus did. And what was amazing is the guy forgot to read that part of his Bible that says that when you go to fast, don't tell anybody because everybody knew. The whole world knew that this guy was fasting. And sure enough, I'd go to these pastor's meetings, and there would be that guy, and he'd be like drinking his little cup of water, looking all depressed. I mean, I'd be depressed if I wasn't eating for 40 days and 40 nights too. But everyone was like, man, God is going to bless his church. Man, that church is going to triple in size. And I felt bad because you guys know I'm all Italian, so I'm a verbal eater. So if something tastes good, I'm like, mmm. You know, that's just the way that I'm made. I'm not, I wasn't trying to be mean to this guy, but, you know, it's like every time you take it, there's going to be a crepe there. Oh, so, mmm. Oh, sorry, sorry, bro. And, and then sure enough, you know, it's like you, you eat a piece of bacon and you're like, Lord, thank you for the Jerusalem council. Praise you. Oh, sorry, sorry, brother. Sorry. Because you feel bad. This guy's just drinking his water. But you know what happened to this guy? Fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, church closes down six months later. Now, I'm not saying that the church closed down six months. I'm sure there was a lot of reasons, but everybody seemed to think that because this guy was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights that he was going to get like some uber blessing from God. 
My friends, that's works righteousness. As if, if you fast for 40 days and 40 nights, God's gonna, you're in, God's in your debt. God be like, oh, whatever you want to do, since you've not been eating for so long, I'm going to do it for you. So sometimes we can be really solid in the Lord and forget that, listen, if you fa- fasting's a good thing. But don't think you're fasting so that God will do the thing that you want him to do. You fast because you're yearning for God. You're lovesick for God. You're hungry for God. You need God more than you need food, and you need food. But none of that puts God in our debt. None of it does. But that's a way that you begin in the spirit and seek to be made what? Perfect in the flesh. And it's not possible. You begin in the spirit and you become perfected in the spirit by faith, not by works. Fourth question is an important one. Look at the fifth question. In verse 4, having suffered so many things, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Now he's talking about the hardships that they've endured, the persecution that they've endured. He's like, look, you guys have suffered so many things in vain. Why why did you suffer if it's not because of the gospel? You read about Paul and his companions in Acts 14. They were persecuted in the regions of Galatia. They had a hard time there. And by extension, it would seem that the churches in Galatia also suffered. And I'm here to tell you, for many of us, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a suffering that happens because you realize that when you put your faith in Jesus and God starts to transform your life, people who were your friends are no longer your friends because you've changed. But you know what I've learned is that the people who used to be my friends who aren't any any longer, they actually weren't my friends. They just used me to get what they wanted because a true friend is a friend no matter how you grow. So for many of you, you've experienced the hurt and the loss of relationships because of the way God has moved in your life. And it'd be easy, like, so did did all that happen for no reason? Was it in vain? No. There's a reason why these things happen, and it's important because of the gospel. And then finally, verse 5, the sixth question, therefore. Now, when you see the word therefore, what do you ask? What's it there for? That's Bible interpretation 101. Therefore, what's it there for? Therefore, verse 5, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of law or by the hearing of faith? Now, this is talking about the charismatic gifts of the Spirit. He's saying, look, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by faith or by works of law? So not only does he say, look at your roots and look at your sanctification, but look at what God is doing right now. In the present moment. Now, listen. The last question. It's important for us to realize this. That oftentimes in churches, in charismatic churches, you kind of hear that these things are going to happen in you if you do X, this thing. Like you go to an all-night prayer meeting and you're going to speak in tongues by the time it's over. Now, don't get me wrong. Praying is good. But again, it's works righteousness. Do you know why we don't experience the charismatic gifts of the Spirit? Because we don't trust We don't believe that God, that the Spirit is in us and that the Spirit wants to bubble up out of our lives and that God wants us to be the scene of His Spirit touching down. And I'm here to tell you, no amount of prayer meetings, no, these things are good, but they are not going to make these things happen. These things happen by faith. And I believe, and one of the things that I pray for us as as a family of faith is that God, we would simply believe that you want our lives to be the scene of the touchdown of your Spirit. Because I'm here to tell you, our lives were designed by God to be the the location for heaven to touch down to earth and for God's spirits to bubble up in our lives. And if you're in Jesus, then everything is taken care of for that to happen. You don't need to, oh man, you need to go and check out this speaker here and he's going to do this thing here and then boom. No. It happens by faith, not by works of law. And not that prayer is bad. It's like, listen, pray. And if you've never prayed all night, it's an amazing thing when you're in a long prayer meeting. But don't think for one second that that's the stuff that's going to get those things there. It's all out of order. So we need to ask ourselves probing questions. Now, notice it says, therefore, and there's a dash in my Bible at the very end of verse 5 because he's moving into the next section. Look what he says. Does he do it, end of verse 5, by works of law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. 
Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now, what the Apostle Paul does, think about it. The churches in Galatia were leaving just Jesus for the, I believe in Jesus plus the religion of Judaism. And so Paul goes right at the originator of God's work that became the children of Israel. Everybody who was Jewish know that Abraham was the patriarch. God called Abraham out to start this brand new group of people. He made a great nation. There's all these promises. We get a couple of those verses there. And so Paul's like, look, you want to become Jewish. Let me show you that God's plan for the descendants of Abraham was never, was never meant to be by works of law. It was always by faith. And so what we learn is that those who are of faith are children of Father Abraham. And you and I are called to be children of Father Abraham. How many of you guys remember that camp song, Father Abraham? You guys are, so listen, you guys know, I didn't grow up in the church. I went to a camp and they used to sing that song. And I remember we, I would sing it and we, we'd be in like the little cafeteria because I'd go to camp and they'd say, and Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had through Abraham and I am one of them and so are you. And let's just sing the uh, uh, you, know, all, you, guys, you guys remember that, right? Now, I remember growing up, I'd sing that song, and I'm like, well, who's Father Abraham? My dad's name is Tom, and I'm the only son of my dad, so who's this guy? And I, did, I had no 